Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. I think uh, just the panelists ourselves cover all of all of those time zones, uh, and it's been it's really great to be able to pr talk to all of you. Um, Stephen and I are going to be tag teaming this. I'm going to be taking the first section, uh, and and he's going to take the second. But I think you'll find that we're going to um, collaborate uh, during the during each content of the slides uh, as we go. Uh, and I do welcome you to try and put questions in. If there are questions uh, that we see, we may we'll address them while we're uh, actually presenting. Um, and we will also look at questions at the end of the presentation. Um, Stephen, did you want to say hi to yourself? Just to do an audio check, if nothing else? Sure. <laughs> and uh, yes, I am the good morning part of the, uh, the session here. So, uh, good day, Alec. And uh, let's, uh, let's get on and, and, and uh, share our learnings from the business capability guide. Absolutely. This is, you know, it was quite a journey to get here. Um, and what we want you to get out of this presentation um, is exactly what do we mean by the term business capability. I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a reasonable amount of consistency, but there's a lot of confusion at times as well. And the, the intent of this guide and what I hope you get out of this presentation is a, a better level of precision on what we mean by business capabilities. And hopefully as you see the examples that we're looking in, um, that you can uh, see how, why business capabilities are such an essential part of, of enterprise and business architecture. And then we're going to go through a few examples of how we develop and use them in practice. And as Sonia mentioned, there's only so much we're covering in the narrow scope of actually business capabilities and creating business capability models. In future guides that we're planning already, we're going to go into specific uh, more detail about how we would use business capabilities within our business architecture practice. I think it's really important to remember here that above all else, the, the identification and use of business capabilities is a means to an end. And that end is to help business leaders and planners get a better understanding or a more collective and coherent understanding across the business of what the business actually does and what it needs to do, um, and therefore provide them with the visit the visibility and the insight required to help people make better business decisions. Absolutely. The, the, you know, defining a business capability is, is, is an art of abstraction, right? We're trying to create some very high-level, enduring constructs so that are not going to change for very long. And so um, we're going to go through a mechanism and process here to try and help you, help you do that by starting by defining an actual business capability. The, you can see the definition here. We're starting with a, uh, a definition for business capability that's been around for almost a decade now, or over a decade now. Um, and the reason mostly for that is because it, it's, it's been established for a long time and many people, including Business Architecture Guild and many other people are using this as the definition. And so it's important to note that a business capability is uh, a what the business does. It's not how it does it, it's not why we're doing it, or it's not where in the organization that business is, that capability is, is realized. I think where we find, for example, one of the biggest things is what about business function? And within the open group, um, the business function is, is uh, stated as the capability that is closely aligned to a particular business organization, right? And so that is a, a specific, um, mapping of a business capability to an organization and it, when it's used in a business function. And we also yeah, find I mean, a lot... Yep, sorry? Yeah, I, I was thinking that this distinction between the what versus the how is, is really important. Um, yeah. And understanding that distinction will help us avoid getting caught in the trap of um, discussing down in the depth detail about current processes and operations. Um, really ensuring that architects can maintain a view of the business at a sufficiently abstract level to help clearly identify where gaps are occurring, where overlaps and redundancies exist today, and um, where to prioritize investments, uh, change efforts to achieve tomorrow's vision. So um, we want, really wanted to stress the, the distinctions here between um, what, what it is, what it isn't. Readers of, of uh, and users of TOGAF may be wondering about the need for this new concept of business capabilities in the first place uh, because it's not explicitly included as part of the 
uh, current meta model within within TOGAF. Um, but as as Alex stated, rather we there is this concept of function, which um, in itself describes a unit of business capability. But as mentioned earlier, the, the practical application of business and enterprise architecture is where things just start to get a little bit confusing, um, since function is more commonly ascribed in an organization or a business unit setting, um, being a process or an operation that the organization performs on a regular basis as part of its day-to-day -day activities. So that's quite different from business capability, as we'll see as we go go forward in the webinar, um, which just deliberately separates itself from the organizational structure and the process charts in order not to constrain thinking about what could be or what needs to be. So when we go to, I'm hoping the description itself will help better, uh, uh, under, help you better understand it, right? So first off, it this always seems to be the more interesting aspect of creating your business capabilities is actually coming up with a name that everybody can agree on. Um, most of the time you want them to be as clear as possible. It shouldn't require necessarily a definition for you to be able to understand what the business capability is, but we do recommend that you have a, def have a description or a definition depending on how precise you want to be. Um, but the real key here is to make sure that it's um, that is very easy to understand and it's not, we shouldn't be writing a novel here. And so our example here, I realize our slide doesn't actually have, is around recruitment management, is the name. And I think for most of us, uh, we've probably been on one side or both sides of a recruitment, recruiting process. Um, and we've, dis we've created a definition here or a description here that says that recruitment management is the ability to solicit, qualify, and provide support for hiring new employees into the organization, right? So that's, the kind of level of detail that we want to get to when we're just describing a capability or defining a capability. And there, there's some usually a noun verb um, combination there, um, but we're looking because it's what we do and not how we do it. It should be more of a noun um, aspect of it than, than an action oriented word. And Stephen, you've probably got a few more words of guidance on that topic. Yeah, I think that when, when you start capability mapping, um, you're going to be really challenged to find terms that are clear and concise enough uh, that those terms can resonate with and be easily understood by the business stakeholders, uh, and which aren't ambiguous enough that they might mean one thing to one person and something else in a completely different part of the company. So there will be lots of toing and froing and, and iteration to go through as you just develop the first um, set of names and descriptions. So the important thing is really to be patient with this um, and use it as an opportunity to to start building a dialogue with the decision makers who will ultimately need to own the capability model. Absolutely, and and the guidance that that's been put in the chat window and the guidance that we also put in the guide itself is, you know, if you should be able to start with the definition or the rule, whereas the organization has the ability to do X, right? Um, so. Capability components is another um, aspect that we've added to the capability guide where, where we're suggesting is a capability is usually a combination of people or roles, processes, some information and tools that co together are able to deliver the what of a particular capability, right? And this is, uh, this is done in a few, to also help make sure that we don't fall into the trap of possibly identifying what would be a capability component as an actual capability, right? So if we look at the slides here, and I know this might be difficult to see, but in our, in our recruitment management, we have some uh, roles of people who, are, who would have some activities to do in this, right? We've got the recruiter themselves, a recruiter in this situation, a manager who's trying to hire somebody, and a candidate, a candidate or candidates themselves. And you can see that there's going to be some processes that are within that capability that are executed and some actual information that is usually contained within the capability itself. And some tools in this situation, we've listed largely only information technology applications as tools, but tools can be almost anything you want them to be, whether that's a, an actual a building, whether that's a, you know, any other tool that you need uh, to be able to do it. But all of these things, even though you may have a, a role that 
is used in another capability, we are thinking this in the context of, a, of an abstracted container called a capability. So all these things should be within the scope of the recruitment management capability. So in actual practice, I, th I find that it's less important that you spend a lot of time um, trying to get a complete, fully documented uh, table, as we've shown in the example here. Um, it's, it's, it's less important trying to get this table 100% accurate and 100% complete. Rather, it's the process of going through this exercise that's most valuable because it'll help you uh, refine the name and the definition of the capability itself, check whether it's actually needed at all um, at the same level perhaps as other capabilities you've identified, um, or if it needs to be further decomposed into uh, more detailed descriptions or, or break, broken up into uh, child capabilities. So this, it's more the, the process that you go through in, uh, in defining each of these components uh, rather than coming up with a completed um, spreadsheet or table that you're going to be using in the future. Yeah, I've, I would say the same thing. I usually use this in the concept of trying to come up with the definition of a, of a particular capability. Um, and where I find people starting to get into the into the into the name and the description, um, they're putting a lot of the other aspects of it. Um, and so one of the questions is, it does not the process indicate the how? It indicates the the how within the capability, but not how that capability is used outside of itself. And so that's that's kind of the distinction that I go with is that there are some things within that particular business capability that that is opaque to some degree outside of itself. Okay, so now we've got a capability uh, name, we've got a definition, we've got some components to help us better and more clearly understand what it is. Um, and now we're gonna turn, and I'm gonna turn this the lead over to, to um, Stephen to talk about how we actually create a business capability model. So going from individual capabilities to actually looking at them in, uh, as a larger piece and how we would actually create that model. Okay, so a business capability model, or sometimes called a business capability map, is a, is a, is a graphical or a, a tabular representation of the complete set of business capabilities that an organization has today, or that it might need to have tomorrow. And by presenting it in a visual format, you can start to see at a glance where the business needs to focus its attention, which really helps um, enable better communication or decision making across and between business leaders. So let's look at how you actually build the map and what you end up with. The first goal is to capture and document all of the business capabilities that represent the full scope of what the business does today, irrespective of how well it does it or how it does it, which is where you get into value streams and processes and, and so on. Or in fact, what it desires to be able to do in the future because we can start to use things like heat mapping uh, to visually identify current versus future state uh, or perceived gaps in the capability model, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But for now, the architect's role is really to identify a starter set of business capabilities that adequately reflect the complete business on a page. And there's a couple of ways to go about this. Ideally, using some sort of facilitated workshop with the senior, senior leadership team uh, to identify all of the top level business capabilities that make up the core of the business. Working from the ground up um, through all of the business units to identify what each does is another approach to take when you don't have the luxury of gathering all the, uh, the senior leaders together in, in one place at one time. But that is uh, more of a highly iterative process. So you, you'll end up with some combination of the two approaches, going back and forth, refining the model until you have general agreement um, across the enterprise about what is the uh, 20 to 30 or so, because that's just a real rough guide, um, top level capabilities that, that represents the business today. And I think in, you know, it's absolutely, and this will depend on the size of your organization. I know for my own organization, we're a fairly big organization, and so you end up having to do kind of both top-down and bottom-up just to be able to reconcile them. Um, and 
usually when you're doing that bottom up, you're doing it based on an organizational um, structure because that's the way most people would do some of these workshops where you're going down to a specific business unit. So for me, going down to the surgery business unit to understand how they're doing things. And then as you move up the layers, we end up having to reconcile capability definitions or find where there's contention where we've got two business areas that might have defined the same capability, either semantically different at the name or slight differences in what they think it means. And that really ends up being a great conversation for business, cross business areas, because when you can find out that you do have common capabilities across business areas, we might have an opportunity for us to, to do something to either centralize that or to use more common tools or to get some better standards so we get better consistency, especially where one area of the business might, might be executing better than another. We may have some ways to, to understand better um, how to more consistently and better use that capability. Um, so it's, it's really quite an interesting art uh, and all of you have to be very good facilitators uh, to be able to have some good um, meaningful constructive dialogue on capability names and definitions as you go through this. So this um, slide depicts some of the areas that you can um, start to look at. Uh, when we say do your homework, we're not suggesting everybody rush out and, and, and uh, do homework after this webinar. This is more um, getting yourself in a place where if you're going to be running facilitated workshops, You've got a starter set uh, that you can put in front of business leaders rather than a blank page, which, which doesn't tend to work quite so successfully. So there is multiple areas across the business that will have uh, documented information that you can go to and, uh, and use as reference uh, information to start developing the uh, business capability model. So let's look at just one example, which is the uh, organizational structure. We've used this example here because it's something that is so easily accessible. Um, your company's organization chart can really divulge a wealth of information about your business capabilities to, to get you started on the mapping or modeling process. Because you can see at a glance that your business needs the ability to, in this example, develop products, distribute products, and procure supplies for manufacturing those products. It also needs the ability to manage relationships with partners and suppliers, to provide after-sales service and support, and so on. The key message we want to put across here is not to make the mistake of simply taking the organization chart and transposing it straight onto your capability map. As we mentioned earlier, uh, an organization chart really reflects more accurately the structure of business functions at a point in time. And these, as we all know in, in working for organizations, ch tend to change quite frequently, at, at least annually, if not more regularly than that. Whereas business capabilities are inherently stable, and it's often the case that a single business capability will be delivered or used across multiple business units, sometimes under a different name. So there is certainly not a one-to-one -one relationship. But the organization chart is certainly a key area that can be used to inform you about which capabilities are necessary necessary to look, to include, at least as, a, as your starting map. Yeah, I think everybody would normally start with an organization as a starting map because there's usually, we can find some degree of correlation between um, the way you've organized the business and, and, and key business capabilities. But it's important to note some of those other things. I know for myself, I, I like to follow the money because a lot of times following the money in the, in the, in the business plan or, or in your financial reports, they are going to highlight areas where there are some, some key business capabilities that are required that may or may not become uh, apparent within the org start. So it's, it's when you say do your homework, it really means that I think we need to understand the business strategy and a few other aspects of what the business is trying to do, including the organization, so that you can, we can ensure that when we're selecting those top 20 to 30 capabilities we want to put on that tier level one capability model or map, that, that they're the right ones that we want to be showing to our, our most senior stakeholders. So let's look at the, the structure of 
uh, a typical business capability map or business capability model itself. And on this chart, we can see um, some typical names of, uh, of capabilities that we might find in a, in a business. Um, you'll see that the, the naming convention is, is where we've used a, a noun, or in some cases you may say, well, that's actually a compound noun. But the point is, it's, it describing, it's describing a what. What does the business do? Um, other concepts to be aware of, you'll see that there's three um, strat stratification tiers, strategic, core, and supporting. Um, and there is a, a second concept um, about leveling, which I'll go into uh, very shortly. But the first one about the, um, the stratification is really used to help communicate logic to business stakeholders about the relevance or importance of different capabilities to different stakeholder groups. A stratification is the process that you go through to classify, group, and align business capabilities within um, these three categories or tiers or, or layers. The purpose being to, to break up the model so that it can be more easily understood by non-architects um, uh, and users. And it was when we said a collection of 20 to 30 capabilities, that's not something to aim for. That just happens to be about the typical number we find when businesses go through this process um, as being distinct business capabilities that, that most completely represent everything that a business um, operation does. Each stratification tier provides a different perspective or a different focal point for each stakeholder group. Um, so allow you to organize your analysis and your planning activities in a more structured way. For example, the top tier, the strategic one, is often aimed at the executive function, their span of control, uh, business capabilities that are related to strategy and direction setting. The middle uh, tier, which we've called core, and again, you don't need to use these terms. These are just typical examples. Um, that's really the customer facing elements of the business um, where the as, as Alec mentioned where the revenue uh, really comes from while well, the bottom tier groups uh, the supporting ones those are business capability capabilities sorry that are essential for the business to function but are more behind the scenes playing a type of a, a supporting role yeah, I'm going to try and answer a couple of questions here in, in my supporting there. Tim is asking why 20 to 30, that seems high, because APC, APQC says you could start with 12. You know, there's, I think there's some, uh, whenever you're dealing with a large number of senior stakeholders, you're going to find that that we're going to have some compromise um, to, be, to be had to put some things on the top level for, for a variety of reasons. And uh, it just, I'm just thinking on the one that we've just been doing for our own organization and we've fluctuated between 16 and 24 and I don't know that we've landed yet, but that we're hopefully, I would say if you can go lower, that's, that's probably better, but just in experience, it seems to be 20 to 30. Um, and it's interesting also to find at times I found anyway, when you, you you start to say so what you know when what are the top level ones and why is this one here versus that one or is these decompose some really great questions um, around uh, around how that gets formed. In fact, the second concept that we're talking about, if you want to move to the next slide, um, Alex, yeah. is, is about leveling, and this is this is where you'll start to. Um, narrow down the exact number of level one capabilities that you're going to be ending up with. Um, so leveling is the process of decomposing each top level or level one business capability into a lower level to, in order to communicate more detail about that. And we do this in order to find the right level of detail to communicate information to the particular audience or stakeholder group concerned. So top level uh, business executives may only want to see that um, level one capability map with in the, the example that we showed on the previous slide. Whereas architects and planners uh, will expect to see a much greater level of granularity. Um, and this is only, only becomes evident when 
Uh, we decompose them down, we provide more granular definitions, um, and this can then be used uh, by those people involved in more detailed analysis and planning uh, to really understand uh, the, the nuances, the distinctions about the particular capabilities that, that are being used at a lower level. So um, when, you, when you go through the leveling process, you start to question, um, is something a level one or a, or, a, or a lower level capability? And you can start to, as Alec suggested, move between 16 versus 24 level one capabilities. It, it all depends on who you're communicating the information to, how deep do they want to go with this. Um, and so if you put all your capabilities together, you, you may end up with literally hundreds in a, in a spreadsheet. So leveling is really important in order to be able to break that down, um, decompose and build up into an appropriate viewpoint um, that matches the, um, the perspective of the audience that, you're, that needs to be using the business capability model to, to do their planning and, and, and uh, analysis function. Yeah, there's an interesting question from Galena, and I'm not answering everybody's questions yet, but I'm picking a few that seem to be relevant to the slide at hand. Um, you know, what if the enterprise has a bunch of uh, businesses that are different from each other? So for my own organization, we have an emergency medical service, ambulance service, um, that obviously is rather different than what we operate to deliver surgery or, or, or deliver lab tests, right? So the top level capability model or map has to, to speak to the enterprise, but when you get down to a specific business area, this is where you potentially can use some of the capabilities that are a, a few levels down so that you can have a more relevant conversation with a more lower level executive. But the top level map should be the map that are all of the capabilities that are, that are core and key to the entire enterprise, right? So no matter what business unit you might go and decompose down to at the next level down, those, you should still have that inheritance back up to the, to, to the level one capability. So next we wanna, this is where you wanna start to do that mapping of capabilities and I, and I, and I led into that where you actually wanna map to business in this situation organizational units. Um, we can start to create maps, maps of capabilities mapping to value streams. Um, so we're gonna go give you an example of that um, moving forward. Um, sometimes we can map capabilities to specific business initiatives, right? In our organization, we're, we're suggesting, we're, we're starting a business, a project, that project is trying to improve uh, one or more business capabilities to achieve something, right? So we've actually mapped our projects and, and sometimes uh, programs to specific business capabilities. Um, and then there's another way to, to make connections and map capabilities where we actually try to look at, at heat maps, which is looking to say, so where, you know, visually, how can I see where there, there's a heat map for strategic contribution or, or its relative effectiveness, right? So how mature is a capability? Um, there's a lot of different ways, and typically a heat map is gonna use the normal stoplight metaphor um, because everybody seems to know red, green, and yellow. Um, so you can use a heat map as a way to, to reorganize capabilities so that you can map between some of these other perspectives as well. I think this is really where the rubber hits the road with business capability modeling. Um, for, for many business leaders, the, the first time they see a business capability model or a business capability map, it's kind of a, a eureka moment in itself. Um, we often hear that, my goodness, this is the first time I've ever truly grasped the, the scope of what my business does and the first time I've you know, been able to, to see it on a page. So that is really useful. To, to senior leaders um, just just developing their business model in the first place. But there is so much more that can be done with business capabilities that are far more beneficial to the organization, which is really when you uh, want to be putting them to work as part of your business strategy, your business analysis and planning activities. And so um, these, these examples here of, of how you uh, map to other business architecture com, um, contexts uh, and, and do heat mapping is really where you start to deliver value back to your business stakeholders about why are we doing business capability modeling in the first place. 
So then, you know, this is just an example, right, where we're trying to map in this situation, we've chosen two business capabilities, learning management and project management, and we've seen that in this situation, IT ends up having some uh, a requirement to do project management as does the real estate function or yeah, business area. And then learning management, HR is doing it in sales and marketing and information technology as well. So what that allows us to go and do again is to say, is there is there an opportunity, right? Let's see. If, if everybody's doing that, uh, I can use a, 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 my own example in my own organization. I actually have seven different organization units who all deliver education, and, and, and not unsurprisingly, they use seven different learning management systems. Um, and we have a number of uh, distributed uh, teams within that that supply some different components of that, and, and we're able to look at that and say, is there an opportunity for us to do this more efficiently and effectively within the organization, whether it's actually coming up with uh, uh, ways to actually have educators uh, follow a more standard process so that the people themselves are doing something differently, or whether I have common supporting tools, or whether we just even have just common standards um, around uh, what skills are being, uh, how skills are being um, it tracked in the way we do that because, as you might imagine, in healthcare we need to know at times whether a particular provider uh, is is able to do uh, has learned something so that they're able to deliver a particular service. Anyway, th this is just one example of mapping organization to capability, and it's obviously a very simple example, uh, but I hope it shows you how how that could start. And if the flip side of that, of course, is that if you have identify that a capability is being used across multiple organizations or multiple business units, that should be a red flag to say, if I'm going to go and make changes to that capability, I need to be aware that it's going to impact across multiple different parts of my business. And often when we go um, doing transformation work or um, roadmap for new technologies, we, we sometimes forget that um, making change in one part to a to a solution or a service that 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 a, a business provides internally or externally can have significant downstream impacts on on other parts of the organisation. And so, by doing this cross mapping, um, we can at least quickly identify um, all the relevant affected groups and stakeholders that we need to be across um, if we're going to be making changes in one particular area of a capability. Um, the other very interesting way to use this I've, I've used in the past is, is mergers and acquisitions as well. So when you think about where you've, uh, where you've acquired a company or you've merged organizations, this is a really great way to go and start to do that analysis. Um, and then here's an example of the heat map, right? And so this is pretty, in this one we've decided to, uh, I, I think we are in, in, the, in the guide we've suggested that this is a maturity or relative maturity. So what we're saying here is that is this capability operating at a level that the business requires it? And if not, then we would look at the red one and we'd say, geez, HR management or government relationship management, we go and go down and look at the definition and say, so what, how is that capability look now and what does it need to look to be able to meet the requirements of, of whatever the business strategy or, or value stream or whatever is, is indicating that this particular capability is, is not living up to what we need it to do. And, and by putting it at the, at, the, at the strategic level, at this level one, it's just a, a, a way to say, if I look at where we're investing our time and energy, is it, is it related to where we think that we might have some pain? And so heat, heat mapping doesn't happen magically. All we're doing is taking the, the, the basic um, or the core capability model that we developed earlier and we're asking questions of it. And those questions can, can be varied and wide um, depending on who the stakeholder is that, that is, is um, asking the question. Um, but it's a, it's a very powerful visual tool uh, to help quickly identify the, the areas that you want to be spending time on um, developing more detail or looking to invest more in. Um, and, and again, any, any question that you want to ask can, will end up with a different um, color scheme, a different heat map, whether it's uh, which capabilities are performing 
uh, better or worse at this point, which are contributing more or less to the bottom line, uh, which could be outsourced without affecting the overall mission of the company and so forth. So this is a very simple example of a, of a red, white, uh, red, yellow, green uh, traffic light type of thing, but you can use any type of color combinations to, to quickly indicate um, which are those capabilities that you want to be um, drilling down on and, and really providing insight to help better decision making going forward. Um, and so the last example of a map is uh, we've changed our paradigm here from uh, from an internal service, which is uh, 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 recruiting recruitment management, which is uh, arguably external stakeholder facing because you're you're going to people outside of your organization to try and recruit them to become part of your organization. But in this situation, we've chosen a value stream example. Um, in the chat room, we've had uh, a couple of questions about um, value chain versus value stream, and we're going to hopefully deal with this particular topic in the next guide that we're working on right now. Um, but just to uh, give you a hint of what's coming, uh, we want to show you how a particular value stream, this is putting the action and how have these capabilities been organized to help support us getting in this situation from getting from product to sales. Right? And how are we getting, um, getting through that logical chain of stages to, so that and understanding which capabilities support which aspects of each of the stages. Uh, it allows us then to understand the value question. So when you did a heat map to say, well, this one's red, if you actually overlaid that heat map on this one, we might find that while some people think that a problem is, is you know, payment processing, we may find that if we don't ha haven't set up the right aspects of how we do our purchases up front, that a, that a prior value stage and a capability at that value stage is actually the thing that's causing the problem at the pain point, which is further down the value stream. So uh, hopefully a simple example, but again, a mapping of capabilities to value stages and value streams. And this, this is a really powerful tool um, when, when you're going through uh, strategic planning, um, thinking about a, how a future business model or, or, or a new revenue stream might be um, wanting to, to work. And so you'd start off with, with the value stream, defining what are those major stages that you would go to in order to develop, deliver value to a customer or to a, an internal stakeholder, and then cross-map the various business capabilities that are used to deliver that value stage. Uh, and as you can see on this example, we've, we've just listed out the, uh, the, the nine or so business capabilities that, are, that apply. Some apply to multiple value stages. Um, when you go through this process, you may find that, hey, we don't even have a business capability today um, that is required to support a key value stream or, or a key value stage within that value stream. And that is really useful information. So before you go out and um, make drastic changes to a business, you can you can really see where you need to be investing in uh, in, in capturing or, or creating that capability, where, whether it's in-house or using partners and suppliers and outsourcers to do so for you. Um, but taking it to the next level, and, and as Alec mentioned, putting putting the heat map viewpoint on top of this. Um, is, is a very, very powerful tool for business architects and for enterprise architects to use to, um, to help business leaders plan for, uh, prioritize their investments and, and develop really useful roadmaps for what they need to do in order to get to the point where they are actually delivering on the core value streams that they want to be uh, doing. And I think that's the last slide um, in our in our presentation as I mentioned before what's next for us is actually coming up with a value stream guide 